The years leading up to and during menopause are a rite of passage. The wise woman inside of us is calling to slow down, to take stock, to speak our truth, to burn away all that no longer serves us, ready for our next cycle of life. The good news is with the support, community, connection, and most of all, sharing our stories and being truly seen and heard, we will travel through this powerful, sometimes painful, heroine's journey and out the other side. Welcome to the Menopause Podcast, real and raw stories of midlife and mental health. I'm your host, Kylie Patchett, menopause self-care coach and storyteller, and I am so glad you found us. Let's get on with the show. Hello there, everybody. It's Kyla here. This is my first solo episode for quite some time. I thought it was high time I came back in and said hello. Hopefully my voice will hold out. I'm just um, coming back. I've been on holidays with my family to celebrate our beautiful younger daughter's 18th birthday. Officially got both of them to adulthood. Woohoo! Go me. <laughs> Go us, I should say. Um, yeah, but we went away and I came back with COVID. So after four years of testing negative, I have just spent an entire week in bed. Um, and the only real thing that I've still got is a bit of a snuffly nose and crazy dizziness, but I'm not sure if that's because we were on a cruise and so I'm a bit land sick as well. Anyway, either or no matter, um, I was just sitting and reflecting on how much has changed since I uh, recorded the last solo episode. So this is, I think this will be episode 23 of season two. And episode one was all about me uh, rebranding and refocusing the podcast um, because of my own mental health challenges and with the intention of sharing um more about how the perimenopause transition can affect us emotionally and mentally. Um, I'm not sure that that's actually what's happened, to be honest. I have always been very, very upfront sharing my own journey. And after I recorded that episode, I felt a very strong calling, not because of recording that, but because of where I was at personally to just... um close up shop and turn in for quite some time. And that's why I haven't been as present on social media and why I have certainly not been sharing my own journey so much on the podcast. Um, But I kind of just realized it's almost six months. So if you haven't listened to episode one of this season, quick um, summary is that I had been struggling with my sleep and mental health and mood for quite some time, but didn't realize how uh, drastically flat and down that I had been until I found myself at a um, an event, listening to a band with my family um, with tears streaming down my face, just realizing that even all of the things that I absolutely loved um, most, you know, being outside, listening to music, being with my family, Um, all of those things were just not touching me anymore. And so, as I described in that episode, very, very blessed and aware of the privilege that I have in that I already had a support network, um, not only a really strong family support network, but also had already been working with a narrative psychologist and a psychiatrist um, and was able to kind of, you know, raise the white flag and go, all right, I surrender, something needs to shift. And as a result of that, um, the most obvious thing that changed because of me finally saying that I needed some support around mental and emotional health um, was actually trying HRT uh, for the first time and also a medication to help with anxiety and sleep. And that's not everybody's uh, pathway, and I'm certainly not saying that that is your pathway. And as always, this show never, ever gives medical advice. What I'm sharing that for is just to say that for me, um, at that time in my life, um, the medication has allowed me to 
most drastically, the biggest change is sleep every night. So eight to nine hours of sleep every night. Um, as I've written about before, I have always found that when I'm not sleeping well, my mental health is definitely really negatively impacted. And I feel like I'm in a very different space now, a really, really different space now. Um, I guess I wanted to share with you that if you are someone who, like me, has always wanted to do things naturally, um, I, I kind of feel like this is kind of similar to what I expected my childbirth experience to be. <laughs> Um, in that I was all for doing things very naturally with no, um, you know, medication or um, intervention. And my version of uh, what was going to happen in that transition was that my babies would, you know, just magically arrive whenever they were meant to. And then <laughs> the reality was, yeah, a very, very, very long labor for my first one. And then drastic intervention because she actually um, was very sick in the end. Um, I have later been told that the structure of my pelvis would never have let a baby out, and that's got to do with the Ehlers-Den loss that I now know that I am um, have been diagnosed with. So anyway, where I'm going with that is that my expectation of perimenopause slash menopause was that um, lifestyle and self-care would be more than sufficient. Um, and I was aware that I was going to need to kind of ramp up my way of taking care of myself. Um, I certainly didn't want to or expect to need um, additional medication to help me. So I guess I just want to point out that if you are struggling yourself with mental health or emotional health issues, um, Again, I'm not saying that medication is the answer for you necessarily, but I do think, or not but, and I do think that we need to keep our minds open and our options open. Um, my experience has been that the medication has just helped me to really, really stabilise um, how I was feeling and also be able to do some honest introspection. And by honest introspection, I really mean getting clear about some of the things that I was allowing to happen in my life that weren't for my highest good. Um, things like old friendships that really needed to be let go of um, because of old dynamics, um, the type of work that I was doing in my business. Um, I have had six months full of really, really steeping myself in that um, very auto autumnal energy of dropping leaves. So really, really using this season to turn in and get clear on what I am and am not available for in the next phase of life. And I have to say that when I was swinging from you know, rage to crying. And when I was feeling very, very depressed, that that was a very, it, it there, was, there wasn't space for me to even try and turn inwards because I felt like I couldn't even get through the day um, feeling stable. And so that's been a blessing. It's also been a bit of a funny, rocky road in some ways in that I've had to get really clear with myself about um, patterns that I still have and habits that I still have and relationship dynamics that I still have and take responsibility for um, either letting those people flow out of my life or doing the work on relationships that I really value, um, clearly communicating. Wowzers in my trousers. Um, the biggest thing that I've really needed to learn is clear communication without the energy of passive aggression, which has always been like a, a real challenge for me in terms of, you know, I was telling myself things like, it's not fair. I'm always the one that carries a load, rah, 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 like just really, really unhelpful stories um, that when I was able to, <laughs> When I was able to sit above them and look down from an eagle eye view, I realized how um, 
self-defeating they were, but also how many times I was abandoning myself because I wasn't actually speaking up when something happened that wasn't okay. And a surprise for me is that that's showed up in friendships most of all. And I think maybe that's to do with the fact that when you clean up one of the major relationships in your life, um, for me with a parent, you actually do get very clear on how that energy has been recreated in other relationships where you're putting up with things that are not um, are not okay. They're actually abusive. And, um, yeah, that's been a hard lesson to learn, I have to say. Um, but six months on and I am really – present to the fact that I have probably been in the psychological season of separation. Um, And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, this is from the beautiful Kate Codrington's second spring book, um, which is a self-care guide to perimenopause and also in Wise Power, which is by Alexandra Pope and Sanji. I can never remember her last name. Something Wurlitzer. Anyway, if you Google wise power, you'll find them. Um, In both of those books, they talk about the psychological seasons of perimenopause and that this is all for a very powerful uh, purpose. And I feel like I have been very much in that separation phase where you're kind of, um, yeah, letting the old dead wood be trimmed back and letting the old leaves fall and being clear with what is and isn't for you. (laughs) The other thing that's happened for me is that I've really changed the way that I see taking care of myself. There's still a couple of patterns that I'm really, really wrangling with, um, particularly around work hours, far out. This is like a real bugbear of mine at the moment. Um, I'm finding that the type of work that I'm now stepping into is so um, creative and deeply satisfying that I can get very, very fixated on it. And I know that part of that is an ADHD kind of wiring. Um, but I, I'm i working on the edge of becoming much more aware of um, not being so absorbed in work that it becomes everything, um, which is yeah, I'll get back to you on how that one's going. <laughs> um, what have I got written here? So a couple of things that I've cut out. Um, I've cut out the type of work that I was doing, so I'm no longer doing any one-on-one coaching, which felt um, like something that I felt like I should do because I was good at it. But uh, by definition of my old <laughs> old mantra, just because you can doesn't mean you should, I really have sat in what do what lights me up, what gives me joy, what feels like flow and fun and pleasure. And the natural flow of work um, that's been coming my way is all storytelling. So copy and content and brand storytelling and the creatrix inside of me, the artist that I shut down many years ago, um, is just clapping her hands with delight with that sort of work. Um I'm still very passionate about helping other women anchor um, lifestyle factors and self-care, um, and I'll be launching something new about that very soon. It's still in its formative um, formative energy. It's actually been mapped out and on my wall in my office for the last two months. <laughs> And every time I go to actually create a container to put all of this work in, um, I'm getting the, it's not quite there. It's not quite ready. It's not quite ready to come out and, you know, open its wings up. So I'm going to sit and trust about that. So yeah, my work, the type of work that I'm doing has shifted. Um, Another thing that happened was I exited a mastermind and Um, that really, really showed me how strongly my people pleasing, um, was still running on autopilot. Um, I'd known for a little while that it wasn't the right fit for me and not because of the content or the people or the space holder, just that 
if I'm honest, I've made the decision to join from a place of fear, not from a place of expansion. And it was feeling very out of alignment. And I actually practiced um, having a brave, honest conversation, which allowed me to step out while still feeling like I honored myself and the other person involved, but not with a people pleasing streak. And that was, wow, what a big, what a big shift for me. (laughs) I feel like I finally got my big girl pants on maybe, maybe. (laughs) I also sacked a couple of clients. So um, the, the people pleasing and really wanting to help people has definitely been something that's shown up in my business Um, previously. And particularly when you're coaching, it is a very dangerous place to be if you're a coach that's overstepping the boundaries between empowered partnership and any, even the most subtle energy of codependency. And I had been clear on that for quite some time and I'd been really careful this time around in business to be clean and clear with my energy when I was talking about what I offered as a coach. But something happened that I didn't expect and the over-delivery, people-pleasing, want to help everybody um, part of me came up with two of my copywriting clients and I had to really sit with the truth of the matter, which is that um, working with people who are not ready to be seen and heard and who were um, still running on that kind of powerless slash procrastination vibe Um And I was noticing that I was feeling very heavy and dragged down and exhausted when working with these people. And what I decided to do about that was just be very honest and say, you know, this is, I'm not feeling that we're the best fit. How does it feel for you? And again, had some open conversations in one instance and um, no engagement in another instance. Um, But in both, in, in both experiences, decided that what was for everybody's highest good was for me to be clear with the type of clients that I am the best fit to serve. And those clients are people who are ready and motivated and willing to co-create. Because when you write in copy, if you've got someone who's not willing to give you feedback, it's very difficult, or at least for me as a generator, it's very difficult to create um magnetic content that really feels like that person if they're not actually responding. (laughs) So it's like, have I got the right vibe? Am I interpreting your energy correctly? Is that capturing you? Is that language sounding like you? Um, Yeah. And I was finding myself deeply frustrated. And so rather than being frustrated and again, that sort of resentful energy building up or that obligation energy, I was just like, I'm actually going to end our client agreement, um, which is part of the contracts that my clients sign, just to be clear. Um, So yeah, that was, but that was really, really triggering for me in one instance. The other one was a mutually sort of agreed on decision, but I feel like this is the strength of this autumn season, right? Because autumn, if I think about traditional Chinese medicine, it's a very, it's a clarifying season. It's um, clearly delineating (laughs) what is and isn't for you. It's dropping leaves. It's turning in. It's reconnecting to your intuition. Um, It's being much more strongly connected to what's on the other side of knowing, so the other side of the veil, however you want to say that, um, to the, excuse me, the bigger picture and the bigger unfolding of our lives. and. Yeah, it's it's been a really cool unfurling. Unfurling, that's a nice word. Yeah. Um when I think about all of those decisions I've just talked about, I have made them through the lens of self-trust and self-care. And so self-care used to be kind of something I used to measure myself against, like you know, 
self-care means you need to meditate and journal and move and blood, like all these kind of rules. And what I am learning and what has unfolded for me in the last six months is real self-trust and self-care um, comes from being simply assertive and connected to your internal knowing. And that has felt really cool, really, really cool. When I'm thinking about what's next, like I'm like, what do I need to actually say to, to you about uh, where I've shifted to? And I think my sense is that I'm on the cusp of another big shift. It's like I feel like there's subtle waves of change that have been hitting my mind and soul for a little while. And it's it's funny how, you know, when you really, like I got really sick with COVID. I know a lot of people don't, but far out, it's knocked me for six. And even with all of my immune support, all of my supplementation and everything that I was doing, um, I slept pretty much for the whole of last week. And I feel like I've been in that space in between. So that liminal space where your body's kind of doing some sort of upgrading or shifting and it's like your mind doesn't need to be present. So you're just kind of floating in between. <laughs> um, so that's what it's felt like to me. I'm not sure what that will mean. I know that uh, one of the things I've been feeling into is health and um something physical health wise that I've spoken a little bit about this on social media, but I was diagnosed with Ella's Denmos syndrome, which is a condition um it's thought to be also a neurodevelopmental condition, but this time a condition of ligaments and the structure of your body. So it's got to do with collagen synthesis. And basically what it means is that I'm, and I've always known this, so super, 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 super hyper flexible. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> the joy of perimenopause is that with less uh, estrogen on, on board, the uh, joint pain and instability of pelvis, back and neck um, have been quite bad. And so I've been on a journey with chronic pain. Um, I've had a family member who's been dealing with chronic pain for quite a number of years and I've been witness to that and lived with that, but this time being uh, waking up in pain a lot of the time and not being allowed to do yoga and weight training, which are my, you know, my two favorite movement types, um, again, has been a real calling to just surrender. It's like, I feel like I've finally thrown my hands up in the air and gone, okay, if this is the way that uh, midlife has manifested in my current body, am I on board with the story that I'm creating? And my story for myself has always been that I am going to age with vitality and zest and interest in life, just like my dad did, who, you know, at 91 was still driving and walking every day and sharp as a tack. And that's always been my story of how I've aged. But I tell you what, the last six months um, has really shown me both with physical health and chronic pain and also mental health, that the story I am currently creating with the way that I'm living and the choices that I'm making are not lining up to the story I've got about healthy aging. And so I know that for me, the next, I reckon, couple of years is about harnessing uh, perimenopause as a powerful time of intervention I was just writing a post earlier today about cardiovascular health. Um, Met World Metapause Day is the 18th of October, which is another week away from when I'm recording this. And when I was writing that post, a lot of the things that are recommended, um, sorry, so backtrack for a second, cardiovascular health is the theme for the 2023 um, World Menopause Day. And the reason for that is because a lot of people think that breast cancer is the biggest um, cause of death and disability for women, but it's actually cardiovascular disease. And when I was writing those posts, I did some you know, research and um, read all of the kind of white papers and stuff about cardiovascular disease, health risk, postmenopausally. And I tell you what, it's a bit eye-opening in terms of, you know, 
overall, I would say I'm pretty healthy. I don't um, hardly drink, don't smoke. Um, but whew, you look at cardiovascular risk um, and two of the big things that I'm definitely needing to work on is uh, the the stress end of things, how you're living in any chronic stress that you're putting yourself under and definitely the work hours and intensity that I've been doing the last six months is not a sustainable way of, um, you know, as much as it's engaging and exciting and creative and joyful and all of those things, it is also a chronic stress in terms of um, spending too much time doing that and not enough time with other things that would balance that out. And then the second thing is um, knowing that I am not doing enough physical movement, Um, certainly not when I've got a big design project on because I spent a lot of time sitting down, um, you know, not moving at all. Um, that also, unfortunately, having been in recovery from binge eating disorder for a few years, knowing that, um, yeah, some of the change in my body mass has been good and healthy and part of recovery, uh, and some is not helping um, the joint and the ligament pain, etc. So, Uh, I'm very, very aware that I don't want to be talking about anything to do with um, weight or weight loss or trying to be a different shape or size. Um, I don't want to be part of the uh, world of information out there that makes women feel bad or less than for whatever (laughs) their body is doing. Um, I do, however, have uh very good reasons <laughs> ah, to try and manage chronic pain in the best way that I know how. And part of that is actually uh, utilizing nutrition to not add to the inflammation load that my body is under already from, um, yeah, the Erlis Danlos. So um, my next six months is I feel about being really intentional with the way that I treat myself and my health so that the way that I behave and the story I have of my aging actually match. Um, Because I'm, yeah, quite confronted by the fact that chronic pain is part of my life at the moment and it's not part of the story that I had for myself. (laughs) So it's time to use perimenopause as that intervention time. And I think that that's the other really positive thing about this time in our lives is that, um, we do have a window of opportunity where we can really harness it to be um, a time of prioritizing our own needs. Um, and at least for me, you know, my personal circumstances are, is my daughters are pretty much gone. Um, we just had an entering fire season in Queensland. So that means that I pretty much won't see my husband for the next six months um, because he'll be away. Um, and I feel like as much as I don't love being by myself for that much time, it also feels like there's a lot of space opening up um, for me to really, really, really take a look at how I'm treating myself. So I am looking forward to aligning my habits to someone who ages well and I'm really looking forward to doing everything I can to make sure that my mobility, my joints, um, everything's as healthy as possible because something that I've been really really present to is when you're in chronic pain and that's affecting your you know, outlook on life and your mobility, it really screws with your feeling of being able to make choices. Um, You know, some days I haven't been able to get on the bike because my hips have been so sore and that sucks. (laughs) And if you've been around for a little while, you'll know that my highest value is freedom. So pain is the opposite of freedom in my version of the world, at least. Um, So yeah, I'm claiming, I'm claiming vitality and energy um, and I'm claiming being physically, emotionally and mentally well 
And I was feeling into, you know, any other time that I've started any sort of health commitment in my life has been code for starving myself and, you know, um, being very disordered with my relationship with food to try and manipulate my physical body. And it feels very new and very different and very exciting to be entering a period where my intention is to really take care of my health with the filter of just wanting to age as well as possible. And when I was doing a little bit of a why exercise um, the other day, like, you know, whenever I'm contemplating change in my life, if it's something that has been something that has kind of eluded me before or been a bit tricky, um, I often will do that, you know, the why exercise of what, like why is this important to me Why and what will that give me? Why, you know, continue to ask the question until you get to the heart of it. and the things that are at the heart of this commitment to some health changes um, right now is family and the freedom and the mobility and the independence to be able to create really cool memories. Um, Having just come back from being in Vanuatu and French Caledonia together um, and just having such a good time, such a, a fun time and what a gift to hang out with your adult children and their partners. Like just uh, to me, that's the juice of life. And yeah. So to, to use that as the filter and the freedom and the independence piece. um, Yeah. It feels like something very, very new. So my, (laughs) my long-term vision for myself is to be, at my great grandchild's wedding in something like I don't know 2065 when I'm 90 or or more, and still be grooving around the dance floor doing silly moves and laughing with my even bigger family, and um, yeah. So here's to staking a claim on what we really want in this next iteration of life, and yeah. Who knows, who knows, who knows, maybe with some health interventions, maybe um, there may be a time when I don't necessarily need the support of these medications, but for now they're definitely giving me some stability and clarity and space and breathing room. And, yeah, no matter where you are in this transition, I really hope that the concept of perimenopause being this powerful portal and also a time of health intervention um, can really help you traverse the transition with self-care and self-compassion and grace um, and gentleness far out. That's been a big invitation for me. Gentle, gentle, gentle. So I hope you are well. I hope you are happy and I hope you are healthy. And yeah, like I said, if you are struggling with any part of perimenopause, please, please um, ask for support, whether it's from, you know, just talking out with family or friends or finding a good health practitioner or or any of the things that we can get support through. I think the other thing that I want to mention just to tidy up is um, when I was putting together my little menopause mini course um, called Midlife Mojo, I was interested to see what the kind of medical definition of when to seek support for your perimenopause symptoms was because I have noticed this pattern of like, I don't know. I'm in a few menopause um, groups on Facebook and there is a lot of like, oh, God, this is awful, but not necessarily a lot of when when do we need to get support, Um, when when is it time to actually seek specifically professional support. 
And I think the Australasian Menopause Society says it best. And they're basically saying, sorry, no, it was Australasia Menopause Society. It might have been the Jean Hales Institute, which is a women's health um, institute and initiative. Um, but either way, sorry if I'm misquoting the <laughs> Australian Menopause Society. Um, but basically they've said that if that your symptoms are significantly impacting your ability to live, work, and enjoy normal everyday activities. So by that definition, I probably should have been seeking support about six months before I did. So I hope if you're listening to this, um, you can hear a little bit of hope (laughs) Um, and a little bit of potential and, yeah, the invitation to gentleness. So have a beautiful day. I hope the world is well where you are and thank you so much for being here and listening in. This will be one of the last uh, episodes for Season 2. So soon in about mid-December we'll be taking a break for about a month and then I'll be coming back with some more beautiful open-hearted gorgeous women sharing their stories uh, in the new year. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening into today's episode. If you love the show, as I hope you do, please take the time to subscribe on your favorite pod listening platform and rate and review. And for bonus points, if you have a friend or someone who popped to mind as you were listening to this episode, why not hit the share link wherever you're listening and send them a little love bomb. Like, listen to this. Did you know this is normal? I really, really, really would love to get these beautiful stories into the hearts and ears and minds of so many more midlife mavens and your help spreading the love is truly, truly appreciated. Thank you so much. I'm Kylie Patchett, your host, and have a spectacular day.